Good morning, everyone. Do you know that I'm a very fortunate man? Shall I explain you why? I found my reason of being. I found my purpose in life. And I'll explain. I have a job that I really love. I'm good at it, I think. And I contribute to the well-being of the communities of which I'm a part. And I'm being rewarded for what I do. So, I'm a very fortunate man. Now I'm curious to discover how many of you are in a similar situation. So, if everyone can stand up, please. Let's move a bit, huh? Whoa, okay. I'm gonna ask you four questions. And if the answer to these questions is yes, you remain standing. If the answer is no, you're gonna sit down, okay? First question. Do you spend most of your time doing what you love? Okay. Second, second question. Are you good at it? Or at least you think you're good at it? Okay. Third question. Do you, f do you feel or do you have the feeling that what you do contributes to the communities of which you're a part? Okay. And last question. Do you feel rewarded for what you do? That's really interesting. Okay. So there are quite a few people who are as fortunate as me. That's great. Now you can all sit down, please. The four questions that I asked you are part of a Japanese concept. It's called Ikigai. Some of you may already know about it. It roughly means the reason for which you get up in the morning. Your reason for being. And in management books, it is often represented by a four-leaf clover, as you can see here. And they represent the four questions that I've been asking you. So on the top of the leaf stands what you love to do in life. On the left-hand side is what you're good at. On the right-hand side is in which way you contribute to the communities you're part of. And at the bottom, you find how you're being rewarded for what you do. And in the center, if everything is in balance, there you can find your ikigai, your reason for being, your purpose in life. Now, how did I find my ikigai? After having studied applied economics, I entered the business world. I moved up the corporate ladder, traveling a lot to the US, to uh, Asia. And actually, I was a so-called high potential which helped me to get my MBA sponsored by the company I was working for. Actually, I was treated like a king, and I was being paid for it. So, that was really a dream job. But then, suddenly, out of the blue, my 42-year-old CEO, a man I admired, suddenly died of cancer. That was a big shock, and I realized for the first time in my life there is a bit more in life to it than only work. And though I was sitting on a golden throne, that was actually the first crack in my golden throne. But hey, I needed the money, so I continued to work, to move up the corporate ladder, to make more money, to travel even more extensively. And during one of my trips, I flew in a helicopter over the beautiful city, and also Cristo Redentor of Rio. But I also saw, and I'll show you a picture of it, the favelas of this city. And a couple of months later, another international business trip, I was driving around in an armed car through the city center of Cape Town, South Africa. But a bit later, I drove on a highway, and I saw these townships. So the contrast between my wealthy lifestyle and the poverty that I saw couldn't have been bigger. And then, looking out the window of a plane on my way to another new customer, 
I was flying over the jungle of Borneo, which used to be full of wildlife, but it changed over time in these horrible palm tree plantations with no sounds of birds or animals. And this was the second crack in my so-called golden throne. It was my feeling that there is a lot of inequality in this world. And I also saw that the impact of our economic system on nature was huge. So the foundations of my golden throne trembled. And then, returning home from another visit internationally, I opened my front door and laid eyes upon my three-year-old daughter. I smiled and I wanted to hug her, but she stood there with a questionable face and she asked, Mama, Mother, who is this man standing in the front door? Whoa, that really hurt. I mean, she didn't recognize me. And my golden throne, my golden throne actually collapsed and I fell. And there I was. And I go back to my corporate ikigai, as I call it. There was something wrong with it. If you look at it, the top left and bottom leaf may have been covered, but the right leaf, how I contributed, felt very empty. So I asked by myself, how can I find a job that I really love, where I'm good at, and where I can have a positive contribution to the world? And I got excited about sustainability, a concept that was becoming trendy. It urged companies to think about their environmental and social responsibilities. I didn't know much about the sustainability, so I thought, hey, what better way to learn about it is than to write a PhD about sustainability. I remember my friends and family saying that I was crazy, quitting a well-paid job, leaving an international successful career behind me to write a PhD, which would lead me to, I didn't have a clue. But still, I wanted to do it. So, in order to make a living, I applied for a teaching position at the Karel de Grote University here in Antwerp. And I started giving workshops. And slowly, almost accidentally, my ikigai moved into balance. I call it my teaching and facilitating ikigai. Actually, what I was doing is I was enjoying my teaching and giving workshops about topics that really matter to me, sustainability and diversity. And I was using my social and communication skills. And I was inspiring youth and people in workshops to look for a life where they could make a positive impact on what they were doing. And actually, I had more time to spend with my wife and my kids. And I made a decent income to support my family. And at the same time, not financially, I got a lot of positive feedback from both my students as the people in the workshops. So by moving into teaching and facilitating, I found my ikigai, my purpose in life. And today, in my classes and workshops, I help people to find their ikigai. Does my story end there? No, unfortunately it does not. There is something else that matters a lot. Why is it that in quite a few of the portfolios of my students, I read that their true passion in life is arts or music, and not international business, the field of their study. Why are there almost half of the people that I meet in companies, they tell me that if there would be such a thing like a guaranteed basic income, they would quit their jobs and do something else. And why were there so few people still standing after having asked these four questions? I realized, and I go back, to uh, my ikigai, that the global ikigai of our society is out of balance. And this is because our society focuses mainly on the bottom leaf of the ikigai, and not so much on how you're being rewarded, 
but mostly on what you can be paid for. And this happened because we made from our society a society of consumers. I'll explain you why that happened. And I will show you and read with you a quote of Victor Lebeau. It's a long quote, but it's an interesting one. Our enormously productive economy demands that we make consumption our way of life, that we convert the buying and use of goods into rituals, that we seek our spiritual satisfaction, our ego satisfaction in consumption. We need things consumed, burned up, replaced, and discarded at an ever-accelerating rate. His advice to the American government in 1955 made that we turned our society in a society of consumers and no longer of human beings. And since we put consumerism by design into the core of our economy, we mainly reward those jobs that contribute to more consumption, sales, marketing, lobbying. And there was little or no money left for social, cultural, or really meaningful activities. The result. The result is that many students choose studies that they do not, don't really love, often pushed by parents with the best intentions. But they tell them, hey, it's better to become a businessman than an artist, you will make more money. And the result is also that a lot of people are doing jobs they don't like, the so-called bullshit jobs, book written huh, by David Graeber. Actually, uh, jobs which are created by politicians and businesses in order to make our, economic, our economy grow. The result is that a lot of people here, also perhaps in the audience, they have to do the things they really like outside of their jobs. But by doing so, they get disconnected of who they really are. So they get depressed or burned out. So I realized inspiring young people and people in companies is not enough. We need to do something else. We need to change the rules of the game. We need to change our system. I'll let you read a bit this cartoon, which I really like. So we need to change our system. We need to change and redesign our economy in such a way that people can live their passion, can live their ikigai with financial security, and in such a way that our society and our planet as a whole can thrive. So that's what I would like to focus on. So we need to get there. So I wondered, how can I contribute to this change? And I challenge all of you here in this audience to think about how you can contribute to this change, which I believe we really need. So what were the actions that I took? A few years ago with my wife, we launched the Imagine Life Center in Antwerp, a place where we invite people to dream and get into a dialogue on creating a better society. And a few months ago, I joined, it's called the Rethinking Economics Movement, to influence the way we teach economics. The idea is that we should bring in more sustainable business models in our curricula, and not our current economic model dominated by production, consumption, and growth. And with a friend, I'm writing a book in which we present a sustainable money system called SAMSI, where the economy is no longer the goal, but an instrument to move towards a thriving society. And lastly, there is this TEDx talk that I'm holding here for you. It's my contribution, my gift to you, to inspire you. And let me finish with sharing with you my dream. I imagine standing here again for TEDx in the year 2035, asking the same four questions and all of you remain standing because you're doing what you love, you're doing what you're good at, and you're contributing to the communities of which you're a part. 
and you're being rewarded for it. And not only you, but also the people outside of this theater, because the system, the society in which we live, is striving, and it makes that all possible. So if this dream of mine, or my dream, comes true, then I will be an even much more fortunate man than I am today. Thank you.